four, three, two, one. Won't you join us for a refreshing glass of fragments of silicon? <laughs> this show would be even in liquid form would be. But that aside, welcome to another installment of Fragments of Silicon, the Euro Interviews edition. I guess what that I guess we're calling it that. Anyway, uh, so this was another technically stressed uh, episode before we got it started. Uh, for those who might not be listening to the live stream right now, I Spent a good, what, uh, 25 minutes getting this thing going? Something like that. Yeah. Anyway, thankfully, uh, all checks seem to be working. Everything's broadcasting fine. You know, it's... Sometimes it happens. It is the perils of live broadcast. Although, uh -huh. yes, technically, we weren't on air. Anyway, um, so this week, we are welcoming um, Hugh Hancock of The Strange Company. Or is it just Strange Company? Just Strange Company. Hello. Okay, yeah, hello. All right, so usually we start our interviews asking how our guests got interested in video games and both on a personal and professional level, but your career path is a bit different. <laughs> you could put it that way, yes. Right, uh, like, right, so you actually, uh, for what, about, I don't know, say 20 years, you were actually involved in the um, machinima. Art style. Yep. yep, that's right. I was creating um, films in uh, computer games for nearly two decades, from 1996 through to last year. Now, 1996—that's a really that's re yeah, that's really early for computer animation. Yeah. <laughs> it was actually with the very first. Um, did any of you guys play the first Quake? Quake One. Yes. Yeah. I so. I mean, I was I was um, very into Doom before Quake, and when Quake came out, you know, played the first sort of Q test. Um, and aside from just having a hell of a lot of fun and making my computer at the time weep and cry and want to kill itself, um, one of the things that was really exciting about the Q test was that it had a demo format that people pretty quickly started editing. Um, and so it was only a couple of months after that. I think it may have even been before the formal release of Quake 1. Um, people started using that to make these computer animated um, films, really short films. And like you say, that was super, super early for computer animation. That was at the point where if you wanted to actually make an animated film, you were going to need tens or hundreds of millions of dollars. That was around the time Toy Story came out, which took, you know, some years to render, if you count the time on all the multiple computers. Um, so the idea in 96 that you could, using your home computer and this game, create movies in more or less real time, was it was just astonishing. I mean, it's still pretty amazing today, but 20 years ago, it was mind-blowing. No doubt. I mean, just... Video on the web in uh, in general was very new. Oh like, yeah, <laughs> like you know, like internet video was just getting started about that time. Yeah, it was barely above the point of gifs at this point. Yeah, and, well, I mean, uh, even like, gifs were a hassle. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Does anyone else remember a thing called troopers? Like. Not off the top uh, of my head. Yes, yes, yes. It took me. It took me a moment. I had to dust the cobwebs off, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like that was like about 1997, and back in the day, it's like that was so huge you couldn't download it in one part. Yep. Oh. Yep. You were doing the old overnight overnight download or sneak into the university labs to uh, take mm. advantage of their stupidly fast, like 256 kilobyte connection. <laughs> Oh, that's laughable now, but... <laughs> yeah, 
you laugh, but you know it's the truth. Yeah. Like, but yeah, and uh, I'm like, it's so hard to convey that kind of thing to, well, the people of today, because, you know, we've got 10-hour YouTube videos. Yeah. <laughs> we have people yeah. who they can't even get internet less than, like, 5 megabits per second. And, I'm like, what? And so how did you personally get involved in Machinima and Quake here? Well, I mean, like I said, I was, I, I've been a keen gamer since I was three, more or less. I'm, I'm basically from the very first generation that was a, able to be digitally native. The first computer I had was a ZX81 and played games on that. Um, so I've been, you know, very, very involved in the game scene, but I've always been a storyteller. Um, again, since I was like six or seven, about the time that Quake 1 came out, I thought I wanted to be a novelist. And the reason for this was basically because while what I would, you know, really like to have done is films, in 96, if you wanted to make films, that meant going to Hollywood or that meant doing crazy Sam Raimi type stuff. You know, you actually have to shoot these things on celluloid film. You have to, uh, do it the uh, the same way the Hollywood studios were doing it. it was incredibly difficult. This was years before the di digital video re revolution. And um, film so cameras are ridiculously expensive. Oh, uh, stupidly, stupidly, and the stock itself is stupidly expensive as well. You know, you would spend more then on buying the actual celluloid film stock than you would nowadays on buying a top end digital video camera. And that um, that that's in the days of. There's a really good reason for just you know what we don't really have another amount of film to do another take of that so go with it yeah and you can argue that had some advantages because it, it uh, produced you know you had to be very very disciplined about shooting but i'm getting a bit off topic um mm -hmm. so basically when when the quake movies came around for the first time i was actually running what may be the first esports site ever um it was called um news from the front and it was a news a news site on the internet, uh, you know, on, on the newfangled thing that had just come out. I just learned about two years beforehand, um, which covered the competitive Quake scene worldwide. Um, and as a result of this, I got asked. Some people who knew that I was a uh, you know as a story writer asked me if I that they could if I could come on and write the script for their Quake movie. They were doing a, the UK Quake movie because all the other ones had been from the US, people like the Ranger Clan who really got all this stuff started. Um, and so I agreed to come on and do this. And in the course of that, I realized just how incredibly powerful a creative medium this could be. Because this, you know, with basic 3D modeling skills and the willingness to overlook the fact that you had a total bu uh, rendering budget of about 40 polygons, um, you could make anything you liked. And so I, the first movie I ever made was called Eschaton, Darkening Twilight, and it was the first part of this tremendously ambitious story of the end of the world, basically, set in the Cthulhu mythos, um, the kind of thing that, you know, I, I estimated the budget I would have needed to make it in real film. It was like $10 million or something. Um, and I was able to make this, you know, in my bedroom while I was in the process of moving to university. And that was really the first, what would become a machinima film. They weren't called machinima films at that time. We were still calling them Quake movies. But that was the first one I made. Um, then went on to make the sequel to that, sort of accidentally took the entire project over. Um, ended up making the film um, Eschaton Nightfall, which is still one of the biggest machinima movies um, that's ever been made in terms of complexity and original art assets. It's one of the first where we basically created a total conversion of the game. It had almost no Quake assets in it at all. It was all modeled from scratch. And during that time, there was a bunch of us, myself, um, Anthony Bailey, who was one of the people behind Quake Done Quick, which was the first speedrunning project, um, Paul Marino, who is now very, very senior at Bioware, various other people were all getting together and saying, hey, this Quake movie thing has legs. Okay, we need a new name for it. And Anthony suggested the name Machinima. I thought that was a great idea. I took it, read, uh, ran with it, registered the domain name, shouted about it everywhere, got articles in the you know, New York Times and Roger Ebert covering us and all this sort of stuff. Um, and that is how Machinima.com came to be and how the entire thing really kicked off. Wow. Like, th there's so much, like, early history there. You know, 
<laughs> not just the machinima stuff, but esports and yeah, so yeah, many I, things that have you know become so big over the past few decades. I actually almost forget about the esports thing because because I sort of I stopped doing that when I dived into the machinima. I kind of forget that I was there right at the start, and I knew people like Sujoy Roy, who became one of the first professional players, and all this kind of thing. It's you know, and particularly quite recently, I didn't play PvP games for a very long time. But quite recently, I got back into PvP playing Dota, and it's weird coming back into the scene and seeing so many things where I knew the roots and I knew the people who were involved in the roots two decades ago, and now it's just this massive thing. Well, yeah, I, I think the connective tissue to all that is like Quake and um, in Software. Yeah. It, yeah, they they started a lot of this. And Valve, of course. Um, funny fact, actually, my second ever film was sponsored by a tiny little games company who were best known for making a Quake mission pack called Valve Entertainment. Right. And at one point, I actually went to one of the UK one of the UK games shows, and I got you know demoed the the Quake movie that they had sponsored to a very very confused Gabe Newell. Um, and uh, took up one of his computers that he, he really couldn't afford to spare because they were demoing uh, Half-Life at the time for anyone who would listen. Took up one of his computers for about an hour and a half trying to get this bloody tech demo to work. <laughs> um, so he probably still remembers me as the, uh, as, as the, as the guy who um, snarled up his demo stand for an hour and a half trying to show him this bloody Quake movie. <laughs> wow. I, I don't even know how to react to that. <laughs> Well, we were, we were talking just before the show about um, tech disasters we have seen, and I think that's probably my number one. It probably didn't help that me and the other guy who had made it had um, travelled down to London on an overnight bus and had literally not slept for about 60 hours by that point. Wow. I'm like, I imagine you have a lot of these stories. <laughs> one or two, yes, yes. Right. So I guess another question is, where did the whole machinima name come from? So the, the Machinima name was actually was a collaboration between me and the guy I mentioned, Anthony, who is behind, of course, another one of the sort of great things that has resurfaced over and over again in gaming history, that being speedrunning. He was the guy who first had the idea, as far as I'm aware, to turn the Quake Done Quick series of demos, because they were just like speedrunning demos of how fast you could get through the, get through the game. But he figured out he could use the same machinima techniques that I was using to make creative, like, storytelling movies to turn these speedruns into movies. Um, and they got more and more ambitious and so on. And it's one of the big things that kicked off the entire speedrunning movement, which is now a huge thing that raises tons of money for charity. Um, but he came up with the... He, he was thinking very hard about the whole, the whole problem of what we were called. Because at the time, all of these movies were called Quake Movies. And, you know, I was trying to license computer game engines to make a dedicated Quake movie um, tool, which, you know, that, that, that was back in the days when Unity and Unreal weren't free. You know, these things cost half, to, half a million dollars. So, you know, I was having to do some fairly serious networking and various people were talking to venture capitalists or, you know, to Viacom, all sorts of other big names. And the fact that we kept having to say, oh, yeah, we make these things called Quake movies was becoming a bit of a problem. So... The, the kind of discussion that came up, and Anthony just one day said, well, well, how about we just call it, like, I don't know, machine machine cinema, something like that. So you could, you could uh, make a portmanteau of it, so it would be machinema, with an, e, with an E. So this is actually not the spelling you're used to. Um, and I thought this was a great idea. It was great names, catchy, it was short, it was self-explanatory, it didn't have the word quake in it. You know, there was nothing bad about this at all. So I grabbed that, and I took it, ran off, registered machinima.com, and started shouting about it, like I say, New York Times, Roger Ebert, all this sort of thing. The only minor snag is that I misspelled it in absolutely everything. I spelled it with the I, as you are now used to, rather than the E, as was originally intended. <laughs> and by the time I realized I'd done this, it was about a year and a half too late. So when you've been on the, when you've been in the arts and entertainment section of the New York Times under the new under the new spelling, you just kind of run with it. Um, but I actually talked to Anthony about this sort of two years after that happened. And uh, 
to my shock, he was like really enthusiastic. He was, he was saying, oh, you, I, I, I like the way you changed that so much. It was such a brilliant change because now it means anima, it means life as well. And that was so very, very clever of you. You know, well done. Uh, yes, you know. that was all according to plan. <laughs> <laughs> Lights the apology letter on fire. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was my my best straight straight face. Um, yes, yes, I thought that was really good as well. Mm. <laughs> yes, that was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god! Like there's there's so much here. Like I I honestly wasn't expecting this kind of level of history. Uh, <laughs> but it's always nice when that happens. But anyway, um, so. Like, when I first encountered Machinima, it was, like, the early 2000s. Yeah. Uh, about the rise of Rooster Teeth and Red vs. Blue and um, all of that. Like, yeah. So, how did you, like, adjust to the rising tide of this art form? Um, it was it was a rapid learning curve, let me tell you. Um, I mean, again, we've got to remember, back in those days some of the stuff that we take for granted now was a really big problem. Like in 2000, you know, I was start, I started machinima.com as a hub for the entire community and for everyone to post their films and share their films. But, you know, hosting was expensive then. Bandwidth was expensive. And, you know, we managed to network our way to a couple of guys who had a hosting company who said they'd help out and you know we upload we so we we got some service space for free and uploaded films to there, and then we released and we look you know we actually launched the site and it was far far more successful than we had ever dreamed. In the first month, we got I think something like a hundred thousand visitors, which sounds like very little these days, but back in two thousand that was a serious amount of web traffic. Um, and worse, these guys were all downloading these videos, so. <laughs> To this day, I have actually never spoken to the guys who offers the, offered us the hosting again. They disappeared. I don't know where they went. I hope they're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully their servers didn't explode because of all the traffic. That happened later, actually. Um, oh, boy. I, so after that, yeah, okay, if we're to serve, amusing server issues. So we basically bounced from one server host to another because, you know, we were always trying to find the cheapest possible hosting because it was really expensive back then and we were doing video hosting five years before youtube even started you know this was difficult stuff um and i think the worst the worst experience we ever had was we found a great hosting company in chicago um who would offer us an entire server which was like a luxury we'd never had before um you know with unlimited data because it was just basically connected to a to a, a internet line and this all went really well until one cold winter's day when the entire thing vanished. Oh, no. And we we w waited for about a week. We heard nothing from them. And then eventually we got an email back saying, oh, yeah, sorry about that. The server froze. And I'm like, well, <laughs> you, you, you've been out of touch for a week, mate, for a week. What the, the server froze? Why didn't you sodding reboot it? <laughs> <laughs> Wrong no, froze, mate. server froze for a week. Wrong type of freeze. The problem was... <laughs> Their data center was in a basement, quite near uh -oh. a lake. Oh, no. And there was a leak. The entire basement flooded, and then because it is Chicago in, like, December, <laughs> the entire place froze solid. So everything was probably lost? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that all went away in a very big sense. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, that, was an exciting, that was an exciting time. Um, but yeah, it was about. It was actually about then that we first, or shortly afterwards, that we first saw the first episode of Red vs. Blue. And the inter one of the really interesting things about Red vs. Blue, I'm, I'm quite quite good friends with uh, some of the guys at Rooster Teeth, like Bernie and so forth. Um, but one of the interesting things when we first discovered them is they had come up with. They thought they were the first people to ever come up with the idea of machinima. They had just come up with this crazy suggestion of, hey, why don't we, you know. We, we're playing this game Halo, and we've discovered we can puppet these characters a bit. Why don't we make, like, short films in it? And they did this, and they put it up, and they had no idea that there was this existing community out there of people doing this. And, of course, they were absolute geniuses, and the thing was amazing. But they got such a shock when they just got descended <laughs> on suddenly by all these freaks who'd been making 
um, games and computer uh, films and computer games for years and years and years, going, yeah, you're part of the community, man. I'm like, what? What? What community? Yeah. They had no idea. <laughs> Thinking it was some sort of secret initiation or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, it was a, it was a little bit like that because shortly afterwards we had the first ever film festival, Machinima Film Festival, which was held in Texas, um, and there was a lot of drinking. Um, <laughs> and I cannot talk about what happened afterwards. Um, something, but something. There's a podcast blood out there somewhere that involves the word, the phrase "bam, bam, bam," and that's all I'm saying. Oh God! <laughs> wow. Like, so, what was it like? Uh, when YouTube came along? Well, of... initially, initially I didn't think too much of it because there had been video search sharing site after video sharing site that turned up um, and disappeared again. Um, and, you know, there was daily motion for like years before YouTube and all these things. And the problem with them all, all of them was, was because the bandwidth was very limited and the computers weren't all that powerful. The video, the streaming video was always crap. Um, and we stuck with downloaded video for a very long time because of that. Machinima, while I was running it, never actually did streaming. We always just did download the entire video file, you know, takes however long on your dial-up connection, and then you watch <laughs> it. Or we had files that would actually play the, 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 the film back in-game. My first two films were made as a mod for Quake that would play back in-game, and that was a really good way of doing it because it produced really high quality for really low file sizes. Um, so, you know, I just looked at YouTube when it first came along. I was like, oh, another streaming site. It'll be, you know, it'll, st it'll sit around. There'll be shitty pixelated video of cats on there for years to come. I don't really give it to, too much mind. And in fairness, you were right. But... Well, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, then the entire thing, then the entire thing took off. And that was, um, I was startling. It was, um, you know, it was, it was, it was an odd experience watching that because it, I, as someone who had been running a video sharing site for years, seeing these guys come along and then just suddenly go from nowhere to billions of dollars, it's like, damn, if I've done that a little differently, I could have done that. Yeah. Oh, you know. Yeah. If you, were, if, you were, if you were running a dot-com in the sort of 99-2000 era, you got used to that. I mean, I remember when uh, I first saw Google, and it was like, oh, that's an interesting search engine. I wonder if it'll ever take over from AltaVista. <laughs> and now fucking people 15 and under are like, what's Alta Vista? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember <laughs> first stuff still exists. Yeah, like, like, does any search engine really exist outside of Google? Technically, like, ask.com still exists in Yahoo, but that's about it. Well, I, I mean, Bing, guess, Bing is still Bing, a thing. Well, it's like, that's Microsoft, so... <laughs> And there's DuckDuckGo as well, which is actually seems to be gaining strength at the moment. Hmm. Yeah. But yeah, it's like, <laughs> you kind of forget how how not that long ago all of this was, if yeah. I'm being honest. Yeah. Like, you know, it's even like the early days of YouTube is kind of faded into obscure memory. Yep. Just, remember when you can actually customize your channel? <laughs> On the other hand, remember, like, yeah, remember when the video quality tapped out at 24, 240p? And <laughs> that was yes, great. Yes, I really do. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. Or, yeah, you know, you, you could only upload videos of 10 minutes of length. <laughs> and then uh, everybody I, I actually, freaked out when it went to 15. <laughs> yeah. I actually managed, I, I knew a friend, I had a friend who was working at Google um, in about 2000, I think it was 2006, 2007, when I made my first feature film. And he was actually able to pull some strings to give us unlimited length video uploads. And, oh, well, that was like the promised land. That was that was incredible. Just this, wow, I can upload long movies now. What, and you didn't celebrate by doing, like, uh, a loop of some guy teabagging something for 24 hours? That that happened right in the launch, run-up to launch of my first feature film. Um, so I'd just been making a weekly machinima series uh, which had nearly killed me so i think mostly what i did was went oh thank god for that upload going to bed <laughs> wrong file no that <laughs> one actually worked out that one actually worked out and it, it, it is actually reminding me one of the th it is the 10th anniversary more or less now uh, may even be like it's plus or minus about five days of that uh, film being released so i must get around to uploading the, uh, an hd version at some point soon because that's still on there in the 320p awful vision because of YouTube limitations at the time. <laughs> right. And 
Jeez. Um, uh, did any of your uh, machinima projects ever make it onto like uh, actual television? Yeah, from time to time, various things did. Um, I did some work for the BBC um, a while ago, which was a pilot for a comedy series. Uh, we we did a, a little skit called Tom Raider, which was the uh, the crazy idea of um, Tomb Raider if the uh, protagonist was actually an overweight man. Um, <laughs> I, uh, it, the sketch is available. Hang on, I'll see. I'll see if I can find you the uh, URL. Uh, I'll send it to you later or something. Um, it's on it's on the Strange Company website. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we did that. Um, did a um, some piece with Scottish Screen at one point, which uh, got onto television. Um, Bloodspell, I think, my feature film has certainly been in, in parts on various things um, and so it got me some interesting press. I remember at one point I, I, I was woken up at 6 a.m. to go and do uh, live CNN news uh, talking about it, so that was fun. Um, yeah, it's it's on and off. Stuff has stuff has come onto TV. Never in never an enormous quantity. And annoyingly, the um, the big renaissance with um, TV shows happened a bit after um, sort of I, I was doing some of the uh, some of the bigger machinima projects because that's been kind of more like 2011, 12, post Breaking Bad sort of time. Um, but yeah, it's it's turned up on TV from time to time. Still. It's you know, have your stuff on television, you know, back when that uh, mattered a lot more. Yeah. Impressive. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was I was so thrilled the first time we got anything on TV. Um, there was actually one of the first things that was ever on TV was a documentary about me, um, oddly enough. I, uh, what was the documentary about? It was about the machinima movement. It was back in 2003 or so um, when the thing was really, really bubbling up and machinima people were being headhunted by games companies and there were always these sort of legal questions around it and would this thing become the new way of making films? And uh, yeah, a, Scot a Scottish TV channel um, produced a half-hour documentary largely on Strange Company and me and what we were doing with machinima at the time. Um, yeah, that, that ended up with me actually getting sort of stopped stopped in the street and asked for autographs level famous for a while, which was quite weird. <laughs> wow. Particularly for animator, right? Because I'm, I'm not used to being, actually having my face on these things. I'm used to sort of sitting in, a, sitting in an office and making characters move around, and then periodically I will tell someone I was involved, and they'll be like, ooh, I'm not used to the idea that my face is now nationally recognizable. I I'm like, that does sound weird. I don't envy Hollywood celebrities. I don't envy people who have to do it every day after I've, I, you know, that only happened for a month or so before people, before it sort of calmed down. Um, right. But, you know, having that your entire life, you know, you just, you can't go out in public without people stopping you and asking for your autograph or squeeing about their favorite character or getting angry because something your character did in, in a show or a film or something. Oh, that sounds like hard work. Indeed. And I, I imagine we could talk about, um, you know, the whole machinima thing for hours, but, you know, we do have to press forward. So I'll just, uh, you know, ask what made you, like, leave the machinima scene and what attracted you to, well, virtual reality? Well, I mean, for starters, it is far from certain that I have permanently left the machinima scene because there is a weird, comp there is a weird thing going on at the moment where I left machinima for virtual reality and machinima followed me. Um... So it is kind of looking like virtual reality might actually turn out to be the ideal environment for machinima creation. But that is a separate topic. Um, so the first thing that you have to understand in, in, in order to sort of get the, uh, get the story of why I left is that being an independent filmmaker um, in sort of 2014, 15, 16, 17 is a nightmare. It is an, the, the industry is... Horrific. I mean, it's, it's the easy, it's the best time ever if you want to make a film. If there's anyone listening to this, or if any of you guys have ever thought about making a feature film, this is literally the best time in recorded history to do it. You can make a film on your phone. You can spend 300 quid on equipment and make something that would have had Steven Spielberg weeping into his beer in, 20, in the, the 1980s. Um, it's absolutely astonishing. There was a film made on an iPhone that was nominated for an Oscar for goodness sake. You know, this is ridiculously good. But the corollary of that is that it is the worst time in human history to try and get anyone to watch your film. And for, as for actually making money out of it, you know, I see kind of breath, breathless case studies on filmmaking sites 
of you know super superstar successes in the indie filmmaking scene and what they mean by superstar success is they didn't lose all their money <laughs> i mean to give you to give you an idea so th this the reason this is relevant I mean, yeah, is because makes sense. there is there is precisely one industry that i know of where well maybe a couple more like you know theater or something but there are very few industries where moving from doing them to being an independent game developer is a sound financial move. But filmmaking to independent game development, independent game development is actually a much, much healthier ecosystem at the moment. So in about 2014, I, I still love the art. I still love Machinima. And I had some real success with it. You know, my last Machinima film, I just cast Joanna Lumley and Brian Blessed and various other people. But the ecosystem was pretty tough. So I was actively looking around. But the problem was, I really loved this stuff. I didn't want to go and do something else that I wasn't, wasn't passionate about because that kind of defeats the entire fucking object. And then VR happened. So I originally got a VR headset because I was thinking of using it for Machinima. And I got the Oculus DK1, and it was all right. You know, it was quite cool. Got the Oculus DK2. It was better. Played Minecraft on it. That was pretty nifty. Made myself ill. Um... That was fun. A day and a half of VR sickness after too much Minecraft. Don't do that. Pro tip. Um, and then I pre-ordered the Vive. And by this point, I was pretty cynical about virtual reality because I'd seen the two Oculuses and I'd be like, you know, they're all right, but they're basically a better monitor. And so the Vive, the Vive pre-order arrived in my apartment. And I live in the UK, so we do not have big apartments. In particular, I do not have a big hallway. And this becomes relevant because the enormous Vive you know, first-gen headset box. The thing was gigantic. It was the size of a of uh, like a television or something. It sat there in my hall, and it sat there for days because I was involved in an independent film at the time, and I was very busy. And eventually, my girlfriend, not unreasonably, says to me, look, I am sick of bumping into this thing every time I walk down the hall. Either test this Vive thing out or get rid of it. And so I'm like, okay, fair enough. That is a perfectly reasonable thing to say. So I took an afternoon out, set this thing up in my office, went in there, wasn't expecting much, came out two hours later, and about the first thing I, th I said was, right, I'm cancelling all my film projects, I'm doing virtual reality now. Mm. It, was, it was a road to Damascus moment, if you know the, if you know the reference. It was absolutely life-changing. It's walking into this thing, and the difference between having a, a headset on your face where you can look around, but you're controlling things with a controller as opposed to standing up and walking around and reaching down to pick things and hitting things by actually swinging your, your arms as you would. I've done a lot of martial arts, so this affected me particular, particularly strongly. You know, being able to use your proprioception, your body awareness, really feeling like you are in this world. It's a funny thing. Before, before filmmaking, way back in like 93, 94, you may remember VR came around for the first time. And it was terrible. It was yeah. awful. But, I, I do remember nineties um VR. Not oh uh, yeah, yeah. The horrible the horrible lag and the unshaded polygons and um yeah. But you know, I had I had ha I had three quarters forgotten about this, but when I put that vibe on, I suddenly remembered that that was actually something I'd wanted to do long before I wanted to do film. You know, the idea of being able to cre literally create worlds and have people explore these worlds that can obey any rules you like you know i've been a role-playing game gm my entire life since i was six and vr is basically the ultimate expression of that it's it's not just creating stories it's creating worlds in which stories can happen and so i was incredibly fortunate about the time i was starting to get sick of the the realities of the filmmaking industry but still loved filmmaking I happened across this new art form, which I loved more. And yeah, it's amazing. Dropping a 20 year career and moving into um, this new medium was one of the easiest decisions in my life. Wow, that, that's impressive. I, no. um, it was, it was, it, it was really interesting because you would have thought it was a huge, it was a huge decision and it was a huge kind of, Oh, you know, I really need to think carefully about this. And I am normally, a pretty cautious person you know i've been an i've been a i've been an entrepreneur in the entertainment industry for two decades you don't survive that by by being rash and impulsive um but in this case it was one of the very few times when i've had a huge momentous decision and i've literally just gone no nope, yeah doing that bye 
<laughs> uh, but maybe not, uh, given what you've said. Well, yeah, I mean, there is this, there is this weird thing where the, the filmmaking has followed me. I don't know. I don't know what I'm going to do. Gonna, I'm going to do some experiments with that. Even, even if it's possible to make films in VR, you know, it might end up being something I do as a part-time thing, like uh, David Lynch does music or painting. Um, VR, to be honest, is probably more appealing in most ways to me than film was now. Hmm. So uh, another question is, you didn't have any of the bad reactions to VR that some people have, you know, motion sickness and the like? I did, I did, but not not with the Vive. So this is a really interesting point, and this is something that I always tell anyone, if you haven't tried VR or you haven't tried a lot of VR, there are basically two things that are called VR at the moment. One of them is the full tracked 90 hertz really, really high-quality experiences, which are the really expensive ones, right? And this is um, the Oculus and the Vive, and although I haven't tried them, I believe the Windows mixed reality headsets are very good as well. The Vive in particular is, it's an astonishing piece of technology, and I have I have never gotten ill in the Vive, except for when there was a horrible, horrible um, mess up. As, as a VR developer, getting ill is something that happens, because every so often you screw up, screw up your code, and the world falls out from under you, and you're then you go and have a little pray to the great god Huey on the big white telephone. Um, but um, most of the time, the Vive doesn't make me or pretty much anyone I've ever demoed to ill. It never makes anyone ill. It's very, yes, a few people do get ill, I've heard, but it's very rare. But the earlier generation headsets, like the Oculus DK1, the developer kit, the Oculus developer kit 2, and phone VR now, things like the, the cardboard sort of knockoffs where you stick your phone in and, um, you know, you can watch videos or whatever. Because those are a lot more primitive, they don't have positional tracking, they don't have the same kind of frame rate, they are a lot easier to get ill in. And, I mean, certainly the first time I ever got ill in VR was playing the Minecraft port on the, I think, Oculus DK2. Um, and I got very, very ill. I was in there for like an hour and a half, and I had to take the next day off work. I was just lying in bed groaning. It was awful. Wow. But that is a thing of the past for me, and I think for most people who are using high-end VR headsets now, it just doesn't happen as much. But I think that's the key there. High-end VR isn't, you know, it's not really all that much of a thing, even among, like, VR headsets, you know, like, like um, the Oculus Rift and uh, PlayStation VR don't have even have, like, room scale options at this point in Oculus, time. Oculus, Oculus does now. Um, Oculus, I've actually been using Oculus quite a lot recently because I've been preparing for the launch of my first game, Left Hand Path, and one of the big things I've been doing there is making sure it works very well on both the Oculus and the Vive. So oh. I've actually had the Oculus on my face an awful lot recently. And if you have the touch controllers as well, which you absolutely need, because otherwise you might as well just sit and look at a monitor. Um, I, I tend to think that there are two kinds of VR, not just in terms of sickness, but also basically there is VR where you stand up and walk around and interact th with things with your hands. And that's what I call proper VR. And right. then there's the other stuff. And I'm not very interested in the other stuff. But the, the interacting with your hand stuff is awesome. It's amazing. Um, and the Oculus with touch, with decent sensor setup, um, Reddit has, a I think, has some really good guides to setting up your sensors. The way that Oculus suggests you do it is actually not the best way to do it. Um, you can actually get really good 360 tracking from an Oculus. Almost as good, not quite as good, but almost as good as the Vive, which is really impressive. Hmm. I, uh, PlayStation, actually, I can't help you with. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, the PlayStation VR is, uh, at the end of the day, tied to a console, which is yeah. always going to have uh, some serious limitations. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't, I haven't actually tried the PSVR at all. Um, I may be about to because they're doing the dastardly, dastardly thing of releasing Skyrim on it, which may mean I have to buy one. But uh, yeah, I haven't tried it so far. Hmm. Right. So before we continue, we uh, actually have a trailer to play. Um, of Left Hand Path. Yep. Give me one moment. Uh, 
Oh, where is it? Alrighty. And here we go. You found me, girl. Don't come any closer now. I know what you are. The powers of the well, the, the, the throne of Xanadu, if we're being metaphorical about it, they are pure evil. You do know that, don't you? You will fall, and fall again until you beg me for the pit. Only going to grow, I can sense it. You have so much potential. So, in addition to that trailer, we have, what, about 10 minutes of uh, raw footage to show? Yeah, I think it's around that. Okay, so, um, well, Petty Pan switches to that. Uh, yeah, so Left Hand Path is probably the most ambitious VR title I've ever seen to date. I like, would tend... I mean, there, it's, there are a few other long VR titles, but yeah, I would, I would tend to agree. Um, exactly what is the impetus behind such a long-form VR title? Is it a proof-of-concept thing, or is it something that came along with, like, what you're trying to do here, um, in terms of gameplay and stuff? It's, it's a, that's a really good question. It's a mixture of a number of things, actually. Um, the first one is just that my issue with film has always been that it's expensive and so the advice that you are given as an independent filmmaker is always to write short and the thing is i am god awful at writing short my my first feature film actually happened because i tried to write the script for a 25 minute short film and it overran a little bit quite a lot it's like one hour one and a half hours um my natural you know, writing just, length just a little 300 percent over a little bit, yeah, yeah, that, that didn't go quite as planned, I'll be honest with you. And the funny thing was, when I wrote the treatment, I genuinely thought I had a half-hour film. It was only when we started filming it that I was like, no, that's a little bit longer than that. that that's, that's really quite a lot longer than that. Um, I, th and this has been consistent. I, I tried to write a 10-minute film, um, which turned into a 40-minute uh, epic starring Joanna Lumley and Brian Blessed. Um, I... My natural writing length is about one to two television, television series. Television has always been the narrative art form, aside from computer games, that inspired me the most. Um, I like that length of storytelling. I like the complexity it gives. And the thing that I realized quite early on um, with, uh, with VR is that the nature of the medium makes it a lot easier for an independent developer to create a long and epic narrative. And so I wanted to take advantage of that. That was the primary reason why Left Hand Path was, ended up being as long as it was. In addition, I think you'll probably have seen the number one complaint that most VR gamers have about the VR games that are out there right now is that they are, they're more proofs of concept, they're more demos, they're like an hour or two long. And I really wanted to address that. And a lot I, of them also have pretty bite-sized play sections. Yeah, 
yeah even, absolutely even ones that you can go longer with they they break up into small bits yeah yeah i would i would agree with that i mean um you know i probably stuck in a fair number of hours into gorn but each individual play session is like a few minutes um yeah so i wanted to address that i wanted to create a v uh, an rpg rpgs are probably my biggest love in gaming um, it felt like it worked very, very well in a VR medium because they're all about exploring and getting immersed in a world. And so I thought, what the hell, let's do something long. And I already know that I, for whatever reason, have the knack of producing larger amounts of content in less time than most people can. So there was also an element of, well, this is a competitive advantage here. You know, I can set myself apart from the other indie VR games by making something that is genuinely an expansive, chunky experience. So I, I would say it's, um, how do I put this? Uh, it's one of, it's probably not just the longest, but it's actually using a lot of what you don't see in VR. That is, you know, room scale, full movements, and mm. all that. You know, a lot of VR experiences um, have, like, teleportation or basically don't move you around because they're worried about the motion sickness issue. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, to be fair, the left-hand path does have teleportation. It's actually one of, the, one of the reasons that I originally came up with the concept, which is that you are playing a wizard in this... You know, terrifying Dark Souls esque universe is because that gave me a built in story reason why you are teleporting around. And this is actually explained in the game is that, you know, you are, you are in this strange magical place where you can dissolve and reform your body at will. Um, so that was, so it was always, I do use the teleportation, but in terms of the other stuff, in terms of the scale, in terms of the fact I offer locomotion as an option. Yeah, that is, again, it's very much something that I felt there was, it was missing from the VR experiences that I played early on and what I could see coming out. There wasn't this feeling of doing something weird and pushing the boundaries quite as much, and I can totally see why. It's quite a small market. You want to try and appeal to as many people as possible, but for whatever reason, you know, um, I decided, no, let's do something a lot quirkier. And that's also why Left Hand Path is... Not to put too fine a point on it, brutally difficult. Um, I love Dark Souls. It's one of my favorite um, gaming experiences of the last decade. And one thing I noticed with VR, again, was that obviously everyone's trying to make it accessible. So by and large, all the experiences are really quite easy. And as a gamer, that didn't satisfy me. So I wanted to make something that would really be punishing to go through and where you would have to learn new skills. I mean... The, the big gimmick of the game you'll see in the um, in the video is that you um, cast spells by like literally drawing symbols in the air. And that really appealed to me because it's the only one or one of the very few RPGs I've ever seen where you actually have to learn the skill of casting magic. And the punishing difficulty adds to that because, you know, you don't just need to flip through the book and cast and, and draw the sigil and then, you know, you're done. You need to be able to learn this magical art well enough that if you are being pressed and there is you know a horror a hideous wraith screaming in your face and um something else coming up from behind you need to be a, to know the um system and you'll learn the system well enough that you can throw off the spells necessary to, to combat that and that gives you an enormous feeling of satisfaction hmm. that brings me back to a uh different sort of a different path of gaming experiences and that's more well the we and mm. the uh, now, I mean, though honestly, this is kind of the next um, advancement of motion controls. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I always liked the idea of motion controls. The problem with the Wii's motion controls was they worked really well for one or two things, but they, they just promised things they couldn't deliver. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, it actually took a few years for them to get even one-to-one -one motion. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because they had an add-on for that, right? They had an extra bit that you plugged in. Yeah, or right. they the later version of the Wii Remotes actually had it built in, so... Oh, right. Yeah, yeah I have one of those. And That's what makes <laughs> makes so much better for the Wii U. <laughs> it, it, unfortunately, like, motion controls um, were kind of either limited or um, they tried to do a replacement thing. Rather, you, you know, instead of buttons... You yeah. um, replace it with waggle, which is the worst. No, yes. <laughs> That's the worst. 
But yeah. I'll, I'll be honest, I, I like this idea here because um, using your hands is usually a big part of mythical spell casting. Just yeah. Obviously, that doesn't come up much because I'd say before motion controls, you really couldn't do it in gaming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was Ar Arx Fatalis that tried it with a mouse, but it never really felt like convincing. Mm. Uh, some people love that game, I know, but for me, drawing drawing seagulls with a mouse doesn't really do it for me. Yeah, I'm like, uh, I had that experience in Castlevania. Uh, mm. There were a few a DS games that had drawing magic sigils with a stylus, but that was a little different than in VR. I think that that's the thing that I really felt. I mean, when I first tried out this this play mechanism, the just the feeling of reaching out with your hand and drawing this glowing path in the air, that felt magical immediately. And that was when I knew I was onto something. Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose the question is, how elaborate do the spellcasting um, motions get? Really quite, really quite elaborate. So... There are two. There are two classes of spellcasting in Left Hand Path. Uh, broadly, you've got your kind of utility magic or combat magic. You know, quick magic, which is you draw a single symbol in the air and something happens. And that something can be, you know, a fireball shoots out or the area lights up or your staff starts glowing with um, energy you can use to um, destroy monsters. And that goes all the way up to you know you summon a meteor down from the heavens to smash something. Um, but that's the simple form there's also another form of magic in there which is ritual magic and this is partially based on real life ritual magic well you know there was no such thing as magic but what people thought there was you know people like alistair crowley mathers cabalistic magic all the kind of you know guys standing in circles chanting freemasonry type stuff and in the ritual magic in left hand path you actually, it's a multi-stage thing. You have to, sometimes you have to be in a brass circle. You have to light the candles around the outside. You have to draw a circle of power to protect yourself. And then you have to cast multiple symbols in multiple directions. You actually have an in-game grimoire, which you'll see um, in some of the um, footage, mm -hmm. which you can summon up and which is basically a reference manual for these rituals. And sometimes you have to piece together what the ritual might be from hints and clues left throughout the world. So it's it's really quite a it's quite a deep uh, thing, and this is just because I love magic as a concept in games and in fiction, and it's so rarely done properly. And uh, is it just um, a single hand affair, or do you use both hands? Uh, your left, the left, the left the name is left hand path. Your left hand casts the spells; your right hand directs them. So you have a you have a staff in your right hand, and you can actually buy more powerful staves from an extremely dodgy man in a sewer at one point. Um, and your left hand is the one that summons and controls the magic. Oh. Is there a particular reason why you made it left-handed? Yes. Um, the left-hand path is actually a centuries-old um, concept. Uh, this comes back to the whole Sinister versus Dexter thing. Left People who were left-handed were seen as, you know, being strange or magical in some way. Um, and this came up um, again in sort of occult law, I think it was in the 16th, 17th century, and continued. And there's always been this idea of the left-hand path, which is the path of darkness, um, uh, versus the right-hand path, which is the sort of path of abstinence and purity and all this kind of thing. And in left-hand path, you have ended up through no fault of your own on, well, not, possibly not the right one of those paths. And the world you are in is a very dark place um and hence hence the name of the game hmm. so how do you deal with the fatigue issue in terms of getting getting tired physically yeah in, in terms of like you know um that was one of the other detriments to motion control uh, you know after uh, you know a bit of play you, you're gonna get tired i i'll be completely honest here from my point of view i think that the fatigue is a feature, not a bug. Okay. Because from my point of view, the way, I, the way I think about this is this is about simulating a reality. And when I go into a game, I want to feel like I'm in that world. And I want to feel like I am doing, you know, I am a, a wizard. 
I don't want to feel like I'm, you know, a geek sitting here with a keyboard and mouse. I want to feel like I am a dark wizard in a mysterious universe. And one of the things that is super immersive, particularly in a very hard game, is that your body physically reacts to the exercise you're doing. So, you know, in a if I'm playing Dota, even the tensest match possible, I'm going to come out there with, you know, a mouthful of swear words and um, uh, maybe a racing heart, but I'm not going to be out of breath. I'm not going to be feeling the ache of the muscles. Whereas if I've just fought some of the more terrifying bosses in Left Hand Path, I'm going to come out of there. I'm going to be panting. I'm going to be sweating. You know, I'm going to have my heart's going to be racing. I'm going to be out of breath. In combat, I'm going to be dealing with the fact that this is actually physically pretty intense. And that, for me, is super immersive. It's also good for you, which doesn't hurt. Um, but, yeah, I, I feel like um, that is such a huge advantage of VR is that it engages you physically. And many of my favorite games are things like Gorn, which you ha if you haven't played it, I cannot recommend highly enough. It's a gladiator simulator. And it's actually pretty good exercise. You know, you are physically swinging at things and smashing things, and you, you don't notice it until the end of the round when you suddenly... At one point, my Vive actually stopped working for a little bit, and I discovered this was because I'd been sweating so much it had got into the electronics. <laughs> uh, your Vive's fine, is it? It is now fine. That is one durable piece of kit. Mm. Uh, Mike, you have, have you put the Oculus through similar paces? I have with Left Hand Path. I haven't with Gorn, but yeah, the Oculus... Um, it's interesting. It's a bit lighter than the Vive. Um, and I think the material on it is slightly absorbent. So in some ways, for high exercise games, it's better. But in other ways, the, v the Vive's tracking is a little better, particularly for fast movements. So it's kind of six of one and a half dozen of the other. Hmm. And um, what kind of save options do you have in the game? Is it save anywhere, or do you have to hit a quick point? Uh, it's... So I, I will admit to have maybe being a little bit influenced by Dark Souls at uh, one or two points in uh, Left Hand Path. Uh, the, save op the, the way saving works is exactly the same as in Dark Souls, um, except that it's not bonfires. Um, you will, early-ish on in the game, encounter a screaming head, a statue-like head which screams as you approach it. And when you have touched your staff to one of these things, um, a mysterious voice will give you the option to um, trade some of your husks, which are essentially memories for pa increased power. But these things also act as save points. So anytime you die, and you are going to die a lot, you will end up going back to that head. Mm. Is there any sort of penalty for dying? Absolutely none beyond the... you. <clears throat> as with the Dark Souls games... As you move forward in the world and kill things, you collect a resource. And in Dark Souls, that's obviously souls. Um, in Left Hand Path, that is husks for reasons which I could, I could go into, which uh, involve sort of obscure um, esoteric lore. Um, but when you die, you lose all the husks you're currently carrying. But other than that, you just appear back at the um, last screaming head that you touch. There's no other penalties. And this is actually built into the game, by the way, into the game's law, by the way. Um, it's not that, you know, you just respawn for reasons because it's a computer game. There are reasons I won't spoiler why your character just keeps coming back, and that's actually a plot point at one stage. Mm. Getting Planescape Torment flashbacks now. You're not entirely in the wrong place with that. <laughs> Duly noted. Like, right, so uh, um, we are getting low on time here as one of our members have, has to get to, uh, go to work here soon. So just a couple more questions. Yeah, I was okay. going to say. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what is the state of release of uh, Left Hand Path? Left Hand Path has just left Early Access. Early Access was an amazing experience. I got so much good feedback from the community. And I've basically spent the last six months polishing the thing and making it ready for a full retail release. And that happened on Friday. So it is now it is now finished and available on Steam. Hmm. And um, how much is it going for? Uh, it's twenty nine dollars, uh, twenty nine ninety nine in the US, twenty three in the UK, and you know equivalent in other currencies. Hmm. And is it just for Windows, or is it available for other computer platforms? 
currently it is only available for Windows. It, it is compatible with both the Vive and the Oculus. Um, but yeah, it's only Windows at the moment. I'm looking at maybe doing a Linux release at some point, but that's, there, are, so there are a few technical issues in the way of that with the, uh, with the game engine that I use. Hmm. Uh, what game engine are you using? Unity. Ah, Unity. Like, yeah, that, that would explain a few things. It's it's an amazing it's an amazing game engine, but um, yes, it doesn't currently support um, Linux particularly easily. I think I've heard this before. All right, so I'm gonna make one final uh, round for uh, questions here for my crew. Um, do you have like any accessibility options for like people with disabilities for the game, or is it just? So yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting question actually. Um, I I have I have friends with um, moderately severe disabilities, so it's something I thought about. Um, there are a couple of options for essentially mental comfort. Um, physically, there is aside from the fact you you can play it standing, you don't need really to move move around an awful lot, but you do need to be able to reach down to the floor. So that that is a limitation on the game design. I'm sorry about that. Um, in terms of um, mental health issues, there is an, uh, there's an arachnophobia mode, um, which I thought was really, really important. I heard so many people say that they literally can't play games with spiders in. So while it is a horror game, there is an option to remove all the spider-like enemies um, if you want to. Um, not disability-related, of course, but there is no way I could release a game with le called Left Hand Path without having left-handed left -hand left options. So it is fully switchable to uh, be left or right-handed as you like. And um, <clears throat> uh, rather a compliment, actually, a friend of mine who suffers from moderately severe anxiety um, but really loves my storytelling um, once tried to play the early version of Left Hand Path and he tried so hard that he forced himself into a panic attack, which oh, that's not felt good. pretty bad, honestly. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that I've recently added because I know a lot of people really want an immersive VR experience, but don't want to be scared out of their wits. And I mean, you know, I'm not sure I could play Left Hand Path if I hadn't developed it. Um, there is now a low terror mode. Um, so if you want to play this kind of experience, <clears throat> but you don't um, want to be scared out of your mind, then that is doable. Um, in terms of accessibility to people with, like, uh, with movement restrictions and so forth, Aside from the reaching down, to, uh, reaching down, if you can do that by any by, by any means, you should be able to play it. I, I've not tried playing it seated, but actually there were yeah, there were a couple of other issues that would make it a little tricky. But if that is the case and you really want to play Left Hand Path um, and you're listening to this show, please do get in touch. Um, I will work with you to try and make it as accessible as humanly possible, and if necessary, you know, might even throw out a uh, custom build. I don't think there's going to be any requests, if, if only because none of us have virtual reality um, gear. Yeah. Ah. Yeah, that ah, is join that us, is, that join is us. A, it's a new frontier. Yeah, yeah, the disabilities is a big concern though for yeah, virtual a, reality. Okay, yeah, because a lot of virtual reality developers just don't bother. Yeah, it's some. It was a difficult decision for me, um, because I am so very concerned with physicality and the game and making it feel real there was it's yeah it's 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 an it's an issue and it's something i'm thinking about a lot for future games and it's something i've heard quite a few devs thinking about so i think um you're gonna see more accessibility as time goes on hmm. right so uh, any other questions i think i'm good yeah that was pretty much my main concern hmm. okay um well, Hugh, um, it was wonderful having you on the program. Uh, That's sorry, been great fun. Yeah, sorry about the late start. Um, yeah, like I said, I personally don't have any VR because that is very expensive stuff. Uh, especially like the uh, the level of VR required for you know in order to get uh, the proper experience out of Left Hand Path. But mm -hmm. those who have such equipment. Uh, the game is available on Steam, and it's uh, out of early access for $30. And uh, if you wish, pick it up today. All right, um, so that'll about do it for this installment. Uh, sure. Sorry, do you mind if I just say one more thing quickly, actually, because this is something that's a bit of a bee in my bonnet. Um, Go ahead. If you do pick up Left Hand Path, um, if you have any problems at all or any comments, 
please do get in touch with me. My email is hugh.hancock at strangecompany.org. You can find me on Twitter or just post in the Steam, Steam discussion forums. I know a lot of devs are maybe not that accessible, but it's one of the things I really want to do is make sure people have, have fun playing this game. So if you have any problems, do get in touch. That's good to hear. Indeed. And um, anyway, uh, so be sure to tune in tomorrow at our regular time uh, where we'll be having Ben Archer of Bishop Games. Uh, they are developing a promising uh, indie platformer called Lightfall, uh, currently slated for March of 2018 for all major platforms. I like what I've seen of the game so far, and I'm looking forward to the interview. Um, so until then, I wish you good gaming. <laughs>